the short of it is, we had, we are now sort of coming out of a period of shipwreck, you know? And <laughs> there's no getting ready for it. I actually think this is going to wind up being good news for the church because stuff we would have squawked about for 20 years, we just had to do, you know? But anyway, you know, um, shipwreck is not something that is new to people who read scripture. Can you read that well enough? Carolyn, mm -hmm. could you read that for us? Yeah. Thanks. This is from Acts 27. In the morning, they did not recognize the land, but they noticed a bay with a beach on which they planned to run the ship ashore if they could. So they made for the beach, but striking a reef, they ran the ship around. The stern was being broken up by the force of the waves. The soldiers' plan was to kill the prisoners, but the centurion, wishing to save Paul, kept them from carrying out the plan. He ordered those who could swim to, the, to swim to jump overboard first and make for the land, and the rest to follow some on planks and others on pieces of the ship. And so it was that all were brought safely to land. Okay, so this has become kind of a guiding passage for me over the last um, two or three years. And back to that Flotsam and Jetsam thing, you know, if you watch Little Mermaid, the eels are named Flotsam and Jetsam. And you know the, the technical <laughs> definitions for those. So Jetsam is the stuff that you throw overboard to stay afloat. Church did a lot of that. We had plenty of Jetsam. But we also have a lot of flotsam floating around, right? And the, thing, the church, the ship breaks apart, the pieces that, that you grab onto. Now, what's really interesting is notice in that passage, it was the, broke, the parts of the ship that broke apart, the ship that sunk, that was the means of salvation. It got them to shore. No one drowned, right? H. Richard Niebuhr talks about... Um, shipwreck as those kind of life, I'm paraphrasing here, but life experiences where the thing that you thought would hold falls apart. Mm -hmm. And of course, young people have lots of experiences of shipwreck um, without a pandemic. Um, one of the most common that churches are notoriously bad at acknowledging is this when their parents split up, right? The very foundation of their existence, just the floor just falls out from underneath of them. And, our typical response to that is to, to actually not call attention to it because we don't want to make it worse, you know? It's all well intended, but the way young people experience that is you have absolutely no idea what my life is like, right? So there are some things in that passage that I think are worth um, paying attention. One is the thing that fell apart. The Ark of Salvation is what um, an ancient term for the church. Um, the, the word, you know, it, when Christianity was illegal, um, the early Christians would call it the nave, the navis in Latin, which is where we get the nave of the, ch of the church architecture. Anyway, it mean, means um, boat, ship. Um, the boat that fell apart was the thing that got them to shore safely. So that's number one. Um, the second thing is, the text, if you read further in that story, it's a long story, but it's really worth, you can get a million miles out of this passage. So they wind up, where they are washed ashore, they have no earthly idea where they are, right? So the people, and they're met immediately by, the natives are very friendly and very curious, and they tell them they're on Malta. So I think we are all on Malta right now, because Paul and his, his shipwrecked, soaked compadres have zero idea, where is Malta, what is it, what's happening here, who are these people, you know, blah, blah, blah. These people have absolutely no idea who they are. They don't care where they, they don't care what they believe. They don't really care how they do things, but they're curious about them. But what they really want to know is, wait a minute, how did you get to shore? What happened? Your God did what? You know, so they're curious, but they don't know or care about anything that would have been held dear culturally to the people who were on that ship. So again, here's an analogy, right? We are on an unknown shore. I, we are all doing ministry in Malta right now. And we don't know who the people are. We are ministering to people we've never seen before, never talked to before, largely because we are less tied to our church programs than we used to be. Funny how that lets us hear things and notice people that we didn't notice before that have been there all along. These people aren't hostile to what the church is about. They don't get it. They don't care about our piety, our polity. They don't care about what, whether the United Methodist Church, I don't know if this is falling apart or not, we are. And they don't care, doesn't matter. 
But they're curious, wait a minute, how did you get here again? That's interesting. Tell me about that story. So we gotta figure out how to do ministry in this unknown place that we find ourselves. It would have been way easier if Malta had found us <laughs> than to go through a shipwreck to do it, but here we are, okay. The other thing I think is really interesting about this is that you know Malta actually um, is a very Catholic island today, and um, Paul is the patron saint of Malta. He's credited with bringing salvation to Malta in the, um, the language of the Catholic Church, and they have these festivals every year that commemorate the shipwreck. Anyway, I think it's fascinating that they credit Paul with saving Malta, because in this story, Malta saves Paul, right? And I just wonder whether this, this weird place that God has brought us safely to shore on, this, this place of disintegration, this place where everything is disoriented and we feel like we don't know the terrain at all, I wonder if, the God's, if this shipwreck is what God uses to save the church. You know, We've had to let go of a whole lot of stuff that was going to be really hard for us to let go of. But guess what? Here we are.